It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. 12 million Africans were forced into slavery from the 17th century until the Emancipation Proclamation. 12 million. Torn from their land, separated from family and kin, their bodies were stolen. Their very identities were at risk of annihilation. And so Africans became African Americans. Years before Reconstruction, they began reconstructing their past. Many of them combined patriotism, racial lineage, and Christian scripture to tell their stories, to remember who they were to save themselves. Lori Maffley Kipp joins us in this episode to talk about this history from her acclaimed book, Setting Down the Sacred Past, African-American Race Histories. Maffley Kipp is the Archer Alexander Distinguished Professor at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. She was here at Brigham Young University at our recent conference on Reformation Christianity. You'll be able to hear her presentation in the coming weeks, but in the meantime, we're talking about African-American race histories in this episode. You can send me questions and comments at mipodcast at byu.edu. And now my customary plea, take a moment to rate and review the show on iTunes. I enjoy getting your feedback, and it really does make a difference in helping people hear about the show. Lori Maffley Kipp joins us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're talking about her book, Setting Down the Sacred Past, African-American Race Histories. Lori, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to be here. I'm glad to be talking to you about this book, and it's been a little while since it came out. I wanted to start by talking about the idea of becoming African-American and okay. of the approximately 12 million Africans who were forced into slavery. I, I saw that only around 400,000 came to the United States from the 17th century up to 1860. And you explain that these people that were brought over, they weren't just victims of brutal physical violence, but you say that they also experienced the most fundamental assaults on personal and collective identity. Let's start there with the Middle Passage and what happened. Well, one of the chief interests of slavers, people who were who were going over and capturing African slaves and bringing them back, was to try to ensure that they didn't escape uh, on the way. And once they got there, of course, not to run off. And one way of doing that was to separate them from anyone who spoke their language, um, family members. You know, it, it was so breaking down culture becomes an important part of keeping control over slaves because mm. the more people you have around to talk to, the more you know you can either incite you know rebellion or you know, try to get away. So, so that was one of the chief interests that Europeans and Americans had. It's kind of horrific the idea that they knew like we have to erase these people's past if we're going to be successful at stealing them. Yeah, I'm not sure they thought about it so much as a race in their past. I think they, they, you know, some of them thought they didn't have a past. Most of them thought they didn't have any past at all, right. or they because they didn't have a written history. So that's the way that Europeans and Euro-Americans thought about history. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have it written down, and it you know, has to be a certain kind of tradition. It's not civilized, so it's not mm-hmm. actually history. So I think they thought about it more as just a, a ver- in a very pragmatic way, separating them from people they could talk to. And mm-hmm. There was some fear of some of their of the traditions they brought with them. So there, there are stories of slave owners who were fearful of the kinds of hoodoo, uh, the root work, or things that that might have power over them. So they wanted to try to, they did want to try to eradicate some of those customs, which many of which were religious customs. And there's been a lot of theories about what happened to the psyche of African Americans or Africans as they were brought over to America. For example, W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the theorists in the early 20th century, and he theorized the concept of double consciousness. What kind of theories did people used to try to account for what happened to slaves as they were brought over? You know, I don't, I didn't see a lot of, like before Du Bois, didn't see a lot of theorizing, you know, in the, in the way that Du Bois was able to sort of summarize this experience. You know, at the time, I think people were just trying to survive and get through the experience. But I, I don't know. I, you know, I have mixed feelings about Du Bois's theory anyway, right. um, that I try to explain in the book that on the one hand, Yes, there's certainly a double consciousness and a sense of, you know, being American, being African, uh, being able to see white culture in ways that other people can't, and also understanding their own culture. It's a very sort of deep, deep idea. But 
What I discovered is there are so many more loyalties and obligations that African Americans feel on all sides that even to see it as a double consciousness, I think, simplifies it in lots of ways. There are sort of other things going on um, that I try to you know, get at in these chapters. And you're going to show that through the sort of stories that, that African Americans, as they became African Americans, started to tell. And that's an interesting way to frame it to begin with, is that there was an origin to African American and to, to really try to find where that happened and how that happened. And you say that it happened largely through this process of collective narration. Unpack that concept a little bit. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I'm not the first to say that there was sort of had to be a move from being African to being African American. Um, you know, surely the, I mean, the, the kinds of people that were being brought over from Africa were from all different cultures and tribes and religions and languages. So um, that was, of course, the point of the, the slave masters is to is to break them down into these uh, sort of away from people they already could talk to. But in the process of sort of getting there and then through the generations um, building up their own communities and cultures, they really had to invent something called African-American culture, which included some of these stories. They, they began to tell themselves stories and to remember, to, to interweave the new kinds of stories they were hearing. And of course, in my book, the most important of those are the biblical stories, to interweave those with the stories from their past to try to explain how they got to where they were. So in some senses, it's not so much that the stories helped them. I mean, the stories did help them build a new African-American culture, but it was also the case that uh, the process of telling the stories helped them build the culture. Hmm. And this isn't something that would be unique to African-Americans either, right? It sounds like this the, the stories that people in general tell about their pasts are these type of constructions that, that, that they are in a sense based in some kind of history, but also, I don't want to say fiction, but almost mythical. Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't make that quite that distinction in the book because I don't want to um, evaluate or make any truth claims about, you know, how realistic or how objective any of these histories are. In fact, I try to say toward the beginning that whites are also making up their own histories or also creating, you know, these narratives. So going back to the Anglo-Saxon narratives um, that the British bring over, but there are all kinds of nationalist and communal narratives that we create all the time. I liked your idea when you brought up chronicles as sort of a description for what these do. And these are sort of counter histories or, or underground histories almost. Right. Right. Again, because they're dealing with uh, in a culture where whites don't believe they have history. So they're, they are sort of butting right up against the kinds of stories that whites themselves are telling. One of the interesting things was, as you said, you don't try to arbitrate about the factual history. You, you don't analyze these histories that African-Americans begin to tell and go through and say, okay, how accurate were these? What, what really happened here? You're more interested in examining these stories to find out what the desires, what the fears, what the hopes of the people who were telling the stories were. Exactly. I mean, I, th I think that you know, that's, it, it's sort of the same, uh, I guess, the same move that scholars of the Bible sometimes take. They aren't always worried about whether, well, did this really happen? Did this army really move over here? Or how can we trace this, his, this story historically? Sometimes the concern is with the culture in which those stories are embedded and how people use those stories to, and then reinterpret them sometimes to, or interpret them to uh, make sense of the world around them. Did you have any difficulty? So you're a, you're a white woman yourself, and yeah. you mentioned before, like W. B. Du Bois. You, you have mixed feelings about. It. You admire so much about his work. You see problems with it. How did you feel as as a white scholar approaching these type of stories? That's an interesting question. I, I had one colleague early on who uh, was skeptical about the project because he worried mm -hmm. that I wouldn't somehow wouldn't have access to all these archives uh, that were out there and. I think that's that's a sort of a common assumption that white scholars or whites make about this African American culture that somehow it's secret or closed off. And in fact, these books, most of what I used was right on the shelves of libraries or right on the internet more and more. But people weren't looking at them or taking them seriously or, or really examining what they said in the same way. So I think it's just a question of reading 
reading differently and looking for different kinds of sources that are right in front of us, but it's, it's a blind spot. You've also done work on Mormon history as well as, as a, as a non-Mormon. And were there any parallels there? So you, you did, you've done work on race as a white person. You've done work on Mormonism as <laughs> who's not a Mormon. Did, were there any, is that a weird question or was there any similarities there in the project? And no, it's not a weird question. It's a, a great question. Um, there were some, I'd say, uh, certainly the Mormon community controls its access to sources very, very differently. Yeah. Um, I would say that they're at opposite ends of the spectrum, in fact. In most cases, African-American churches uh, and communities haven't had the resources, the money, to preserve their sources. And they haven't, um, so they haven't preserved the text of these things. A lot of this, especially in the 20th century, is in the form of oral tradition. And while that's true for Mormons, and there certainly is an active oral tradition alongside written record, Mormons from the beginning were so concerned about preservation and had, in the 20th century, have had the resources to preserve and to protect, um, you know, because of, I think, their sense of the criticism they were going to get, and they did get from other white Americans. They were, I think, understandably cautious about sort of letting people, giving people access. I haven't had much trouble with access, but I, I think the, the advantage of being an outsider is just that you see things differently. I mm-hmm. certainly hope that's true of my reading of the Mormon tradition and that it doesn't, you know, come across as a, a criticism. It's really, I think you just get a different vantage point if you're not standing within something. On a personal note, familiarity with some of your work on Mormonism made me even more comfortable with what you're doing here because I've seen the way that you've worked with Mormon sources and Mormon history mm-hmm. and, and the sensitive way that you treat that and, and, and feel like, okay, th- I've seen how you operate there. This is probably the same type, type of situation. So I can, Oh, uh, good. It worked. It boosted confidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then before we go into some of the details, so you're drawing on letters, articles, books, and other writings that African Americans created. Uh, You also write in the introduction, there's this really important caveat there. You say, African Americans have always disagreed in fundamental and sometimes vocal ways about what it means to be African American, to be Christian, to be American. So there's no single African American story here. Right. Well, that's uh, one of the things I tried to do with the book, in fact, was to alternate in the chapters between movements toward integration, towards building up something called an African-American history, and the movements toward, uh, I don't want to say disintegration, but uh, fracturing of that picture. So uh, in part because I am so aware of the way that even today we we tend to talk about African-American Christianity or the black church as if it's some big thing. And it's not. It's it's many things. And it's uh, just as complicated as sort of white Christianity. And I wanted to point out some of the ways in which people, there are tensions within this and people are arguing. And so my, even my take on Du Bois, I would say, um, I like Du Bois a lot. I just think it's important to recognize that he is seeing things from a particular vantage point. He's seeing slavery from the the vantage of a free African American in the, who's been educated and grew up in the North. So he has a certain vantage on the Southern Black experience that isn't based in his own past. It's it's something he's observing, and that's it's an important observation. But it doesn't tell us everything. Right. That's Lori Maffley Kipp, and we're talking about her book, Setting Down the Sacred Past, African-American Race Histories. So the first chapter of your book, Wonders of the Ancient Past, kind of gets into some of the earliest narratives that started to emerge as Africans became African-Americans. What sort of stories began to circulate in those first decades of American slavery? They were stories based on biblical readings, in part because the level of literacy in the African and African American population at that point was pretty low. And the people who gained literacy first were African American preachers. And the texts they use and the ways, often the ways in which they learned to read were by reading the Bible. So those were the stories they had to start with. And they built on those stories and used those stories as a way, again, of explaining their own fate and uh, bringing their own experience, as we all do, into our reading of the Bible. 
So um, it, I used sermons from Northern African American uh, African American ministers in the Northern states who were just beginning to form denominations and to speak to communities in ways that they thought were going to help them build toward a future. So they would talk about sort of glorious African past and, and, and this lost wisdom. And you say that right. they drew on two institutions were kind of very influential, Protestant Christianity and also Masonry, which was a surprise to me. Yeah, uh, Masonry um, is a tradition, again, that a lot of these African-American preachers were involved with. It provided, um, and it was segregated still. So these were black Masonic this is a black Masonic movement, starting with the Prince Hall Masons, because the whites would not allow them into regular Masonry. But it also provided a kind of interpretation of the past that helped them, that fit well into the kinds of things that they were already doing and their own experience, because some of the Masonic past is located in Africa, in Egypt, in sort of ancient lore that interweaves where they had come from with biblical stories uh, and then ties into their own sort of ongoing experience. Yeah, they would sort of weave themselves into this sacred history, this history that goes yep. back to, and masonry they would trace back, right? So it was sort of came out of these ancient origins and there might have been some wisdom lost along the way and now they were trying to recover that or, or get back to that original wisdom, which came from their culture. They, as they yeah, were, you know, yeah, they saw it. It's African wisdom, right? That's, and that's what um, sort of the Masonic origin stories talk about. So it was easy for them to say, huh, here it is. People have been trying to cover up the fact that this was our people also who sort of had this original wisdom and have been passing it along over the years. Yeah, there's almost like a, a a great apostasy narrative almost, right? Where there mm. was this glorious, they would look back to things like the glories of ancient Egypt and things like this, yeah. where there was king kingship and royalty and, and wisdom, and, and they were the, the cradle of civilization. And then something happened and that was lost, and now they find themselves torn from their homes and kind of in this foreign land. Yeah, it's that's great, Blair. I've never thought about it as a restorationist movement in the yeah. same way as the great apostasy, but there are certainly some parallels. That really struck me as, as I was reading uh -huh. along. You mentioned about an African-American minister. So the question that a lot of people have is, how did so many African-Americans come to embrace Christianity? Because it was the religion of their oppressors, really. Yeah, that's a great question and a big question that scholars have been thinking about and pondering for a long time. There are lots of reasons, I think. Um, probably many of them initially very practical reasons that uh, in the South, in the slave-owning South, there were you know, Christian missionaries trying to convert slaves and often coming into conflict with slave masters because they had differing purposes. So um, sometimes with missionaries, they wanted to, for example, give slaves Sundays off so that they could, you know, come to church, be catechized, you know, learn the lessons that they wanted them to learn. And slave masters didn't want to allow that kind of freedom. It was a sort of freedom um, and perhaps a freedom of uh, sort of finding ways to get ideas that slave masters thought were not in their best interests as owners. Um, so that's their, their practical reasons. It gave slaves some time away from their work and from their um, master. It also, um, increasingly, especially in the North, late 18th century, around the time of the revolution and after, it gave African Americans an independent voice. Some of these churches started out, and an independent power, cultural power. So some of these churches started out with things like burial societies for widows to give people resources and money to bury their dead, which was not allowed them, or to found schools, which because they were kept out of the public schools. So it gave them um, some practical things. On the other hand, I think going along with that, these stories and the traditions of the church can't be ignored in all this. In the northern states, um, the church became a powerful voice within the community and also allowed African Americans an independent voice and a way to endure the kinds of assaults that they were facing constantly, even outside of slavery. Yeah, and as you mentioned, there were slave holders that were sort of uncomfortable with this. And there were some white Americans that were beginning that were telling their own stories about based on Protestant Christianity or Christian ideas. So what narratives were developing um, on that side of things that African Americans would then have to confront? Well, one major story was that 
either that African Americans and Africans were not fully human in some measure. Now, this is hard to square with the Bible, <laughs> but yeah. there were even some some white Christians who, a you know, few, who came to believe that there were two different creation stories, that blacks were not created at the same time that whites were. Most often, though, people came to understand this by talking about civilization, that Africans were uncivilized people and could never attain the kind of you know, capacities necessary for freedom in the American sense. Uh, and in the South, and this was a particularly tenacious kind of story that African Americans were um, better off uh, uh, being kept more like children. So there's a patriarchal story that talked about the, sort of the, the benevolent white patriarchs who took care of slaves. And who, of course, this went against all reality, where people, families were getting ripped apart and you know, people were, were physically punished for all sorts of things and controlled completely. But it's a story that whites told, I think, to make themselves feel better about the horrors that they were inflicting. That's what makes it so fascinating that Christianity itself became a tool for some African Americans to resist that, to resist the oppressors yes. who were employing Christianity against them. Yeah, well, what better way to, to push back by taking their own stories and reinterpreting them, right? <laughs> It, yeah, it, it really helps understand um, there's some of the ideas within Christianity that, that could challenge Christianity or the ways that other people understand Christianity. I mean, that's sort of the story of, of the Reformation itself, this idea that uh, competing visions can, can arise from the same sources. Well, isn't that another, that's another um, parallel with the Mormon story, right? Is that there, that in some ways, I mean, there was a new revelation, obviously, for Joseph Smith, but it was also... An inter a reinterpretation mm -hmm. of the older story. Yep. It couldn't have existed without it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we've touched on this a little bit already, but did African Americans tend to embrace the same type of Christianity? What are some of the divisions that arose among denominational lines? That's a great question. Early on in the northern states, which is where the black denominations first started to develop, there was a great deal of interest in preserving the kind of structure, church structure uh, and doctrine that blacks had known in white churches. So the first African-American um, denominations were Methodists at the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1816, and then uh, the A African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church uh, in 1821. And these were churches that replicated pretty much um, the kind of doctrine that they had gotten from their Methodist roots because they considered themselves to be the true Methodists. They weren't trying to overthrow Methodism. They were trying to get rid of the racism of white Methodism. And they saw the whites, of course, as being uh, the ones who had strayed from the path. And there were disagreements over how close to remain to that original tradition, right? I mean, this was a sort of Methodist primitivism almost, like we're, we're, yeah. we're getting to the roots of Methodism. Is this how the division between the AME and the, or the, uh, yeah, AME, the AME. AMEZ happened uh -huh. was about like, you guys are still too tied to the white structure kind of a thing. A part, that was it. I think uh, the bigger part was just a power struggle, frankly, mm. um, between some of the leaders uh, of the AME, like Richard Allen, and other AMEZ leaders who didn't like that leadership. It was, and it wasn't really so much about doctrines. It was about it was a it was a personality issue. There were all kinds of um, not so nice things that the AMEZ folks would say about AME, and vice versa. You know, they they wanted they all thought that the ideal, of course, was union, but they couldn't figure out um, a way to do that that didn't somehow undermine what each of them was already starting to build. This is what's so captivating, I think, about, about this book is how it, nothing, nothing is as simple as you might expect. <laughs> you can drill down on everything, and there's so many unexpected negotiations and alliances and disagreements all over the place. This story yeah. is not a simple story. It's not. And I have been accused before of being a, a splitter, not a lumper, as they say <laughs> in the historical <laughs> profession. I, you know, I think it is important to sort of give voice to these different opinions. Again, to bring this community, to pull apart this thing called black church life and to say, look at the, the kinds of issues and diversity that these folks are dealing with. <laughs> 
And you say that African-American religious history is a, is a long series of negotiations. You use the word, it's negotiations between race consciousness, so how they view themselves when, and what their race is, uh, denominational loyalties, and Christian commitments. And these can bump into each other, right? So, right. for example, like the Christian commitment of being united as one in the body of Christ, that's a, that's a Christian commitment, a Christian value could bump up against the fact that there's division there. There's denominational loyalties yeah. and some of them based on race. And so they had to come up with stories to explain that. Exactly. Exactly. Now, and we all do that in some respects that if we are Christians in some way, there has to be some way of understanding why we aren't all Christians together. What, yeah. what is it that's keeping us apart? So before the Civil War, what kind of stories would they tell to answer that? They had to justify separation from other white worshipers. How, yeah. would, how did they do that? Well, I mean, one the, the easiest way was to say that the white worshipers aren't being truly Christian. They aren't allowing us to worship freely. They aren't including us in their sort of the discipline of the church and the leadership of the church. This isn't real Christianity. And this, is, this was the story throughout the antebellum era before the Civil War. And Frederick, someone like Frederick Douglass, in his autobiography, talks about this difference between the black church and the white church and labels the white church as a false Christianity. It's not true because these people are upholding slavery and therefore they are not really Christian. I mean, this kind of speaks to the beginning of the AME church, Richard Allen. There's that, the origin story basically happens within a white church where African-American worshipers are asked to move. Yeah, that's sort of the, the, the basic, the foundational kind of story is that we are now not allowed, we are not even allowed to worship in a way that we are not even allowed to pray in the church hmm. um, without being interrupted. Was there a hope for recovery for or reconciliation at some point? So they've separated out, they've formed their own denominations. Did they feel a desire to sort of convert the, the white Christians who, who they had separated from? Or did they feel like we're on our own path at this point? Yeah, I don't, I don't see much evidence that in the, before the Civil War, they were trying to think very much about converting whites. Certainly they made their case publicly for why this wasn't Christian and for any whites that were willing to listen to it. Uh, and some were, but um, you know they had so much to focus on in their own community, mm. and and in, of course again these were northern preachers for the most part in the antebellum era, so they were worried about the southerners, and many of them had family in the south, so this was a a family story of people whose whose sometimes whose um, wives or husbands or parents or children were enslaved still, so. Mm. There was a lot to do, and um, I think you know, starting a evangelistic outreach to whites <laughs> was probably down the list at yeah. that point. Now, that's not to say that, and this is sort of jumping ahead to a later chapter, but it's not to say that they didn't think some, of, in theory, about what was going to happen you know, later on and mm -hmm. what in, in the hereafter or whenever it, it, you know, God had sort of the, the means of bringing it about that there wouldn't be racial reconciliation. Right. It just wasn't on the front burner at this point. It's, it's not on the front burner, yeah. no. <laughs> so, yeah. So before the Civil War, you talk about how they're justifying separation from other white worshipers. And then after the Civil War, their histories that they're writing at this point are really trying to understand the divisions among black Christians at this point in these denominational histories. Right. I mean, you'd think, you know, here we are, we've, we've attained freedom. We can go south and not only rescue our previously enslaved brothers and sisters, but we can bring them the blessings of this Christianity that we have received in the North. So you see this as, as African-American Northerners begin to go South after the Civil War, they are bringing Christianity to slaves. And of course, there was already Christianity in the South under slavery, but it was a diff, sort of a different, of a different flavor by then because they hadn't had the freedom to worship on their own in the South. So Northerners think that they are bringing this great gift to their Southern brethren. That's Lori Maffley Kipp. She is the Archer Alexander Distinguished Professor at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. And we're talking about her book, Setting Down the Sacred Past, African-American Race Histories. Lori, African-Americans 
drew on biblical narratives, as you mentioned at the outset, to kind of help map themselves into the Christian story. And the Exodus narrative you mentioned seems to provide an obvious point of departure here. This is an enslaved people in Egypt. You have Moses arising as a leader under God's direction. They become free. What's, what's a favorite example of yours of, of a writer at this time who employed the Exodus narrative, and, and how did they do that? Um, let's see, probably, and there are lots and lots of examples. Probably one of the more interesting ones was a man named James Theodore Hawley, who was an Episcopal minister. He was interested in, as were a lot of African Americans in the antebellum era, in the possibility of sending African Americans back to parts of Africa or to Haiti because Haiti at this point is an independent African nation, essentially, or Afri a colonized African nation. So he gets involved with sort of this group, this group uh, of people who want to send boats off to Haiti, and in part because Haiti was a free place and they thought that they could so bring people in who could then be freed, but also because they thought that, again, they could bring the blessings of this Christian tradition to Haitian people. So this was sort of a, you know, it was a trade-off as they saw it. Um, we can bring you good things and you'll give us this kind of free society. And in doing so, he talked a lot about this as an exodus, right? The, the, the theme of exodus comes up over and over again as Africans and African Americans are thinking about moving, either moving to Haiti. Others tried to find places in the West to move. Um, and in fact, there is a movement after the Civil War of a group called the Exodusters. These were African Americans moving from southern states to places like Kansas and developing all black towns in Kansas, who definitely referred to this as, as an exodus. They uh, saw um, their, one of their main leaders as, a man, as Moses. And so they really figured this as a reliving of the people in bondage who had moved into what they hoped to be the promised land. And Holly's hopes about doing that seemed to have been somewhat dashed. It, it didn't, it didn't yeah. seem like the Haitian exoduses, and there were multiple literal attempts where they would take yeah. specific people over. It didn't seem like that was a very successful enterprise in the end. No, it was not at all successful. And they, they, this was tried in the 1820s. It was tried again in, by Holly and others in, right before the Civil War. But of course, you know, the people in Haiti, for all that African Americans thought they weren't really Christians, had their own version of Christianity. And they really weren't thrilled uh, for some surprising reason about these American, what they saw as Americans coming over and trying to change their ways. Um, they thought that the Americans ought to just be happy, these African Americans ought to just be happy that they were not enslaved anymore and, you know, fit into our society, don't try to change us. And you also talked about how selective the Exodus parallel was, right? I mean, in the Hebrew scriptures account, you have the Israelites leaving and, and coming into a land and sort of interacting with the people of Canaan and this sort of thing. So mm. the parallels didn't go too deep into the biblical soil as well when it came to Exodus. No, no, they didn't line up perfectly. I mean, there was, yeah, and as I say, there's never any attempt to figure out what's going to happen to the people already in the promised land exactly. once you show up, right? And that's, <laughs> all, that's, the, that's the big rub in Haiti is, you know, yeah. there are people there. What are we going to do? Are we going to you know, change them? Or are they just going to somehow, the Bible's not very, <laughs> very uh, clear about that either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the Ethiopian prophecy is is a lesser known scriptural pattern that they would draw on in addition to the Exodus. The, this is a verse from the Bible that says, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. How did this verse figure into the stories that African Americans begin to tell? Well, this comes to be seen as a promise that God has made to, the, to African peoples. Of course, Ethiopia at this point was taken to mean all African peoples. It was sort of a, a, you know, conflated in that way with Africa in general. And it was seen as a promise that there was a, sort of a millennial promise at some times that there was a, a grand future uh, waiting for Africans and African Americans down the road and uh, what that might mean you know people disagreed about but that was certainly a hope that that 
kept a lot of people um, inspired and going forward. And it was all over African American Christian culture. I mean, it's it is interesting that you weren't as familiar with that because any African American Christian in the in the nineteenth century could have quoted that to you. It was yeah. on the masthead of church newspapers. It was ubiquitous. Yeah, and and it also tied into this sort of a controversial idea about God's providence, like the direction of God in all of this. The notion that that slavery might have been in some way approved by God or or directed by God, so that Africans could come into contact with Christianity and then carry those truths back to Africa. Right? I'm thinking of like Edward right. Lydon, for example. He said that we'll bring with us the spoils of the house of bondage. Exactly. Well, this, yeah, and this is still, I think, a hugely controversial point in the history of African American Christianity, the idea that there were African American Christians, not all of them, but certainly many of them, who made sense of this legacy of slavery by saying, hmm, God had a plan in all this. It's, you know, it's a way of understanding suffering. I mean, this goes back to Job, where we all have to sort of find ways to understand deep suffering in the world. And some African Americans interpreted this as a way that God could use the African people by enslaving them, by having them experience this this horrifying thing so that they could provide wisdom for later generations. They could go back to Africa and spread the story of God's working in the world. This, this is not the end of the story. The sl- slavery is not the end. We have, there's more to come. There are glorious things to come. We are here to bring that story to you. And God is working through all of this. And they also wanted to bring with them a God that reflected their own bodies even, right? Edward Blyden and others, for example, had Jesus as an African. Yeah, yeah. There was, a, again, a, a lot of sense that um, this story has been misinterpreted over the years, and uh, God has been whitened, Jesus has been whitened, and we need to understand that if, if indeed this story starts in sort of the Middle East, this part of the world, in Northern Africa, then... Yes, God in some ways can be figured as African or African American. In another chapter, in the, in the next chapter, um, you talk about what you call the uh, Negro race history. So, mm-hmm. what's happening here is conditions for African Americans are changing, right? They, they're, they're yeah. from slavery, they, there's emancipation, and they need different things from the histories that they're telling. So, the Exodus story is less of a powerful symbol once you're no longer trying to become right. free, so to speak, right? So right. after emancipation, they need more than that. So between 1867 and 1920, you find a number of books that appear, these race histories. Right, right. Uh, African Americans are trying, yes, to, to, to chronicle, to write this down so that it, they can spread it to other, other newly, you know, newly freed people. And Many of these are, I mean, not unlike the kind of history that's being written by whites at the time, which tend to be these, you know, chronicles of the world, right? These, these yeah. big narratives about, you know, the, from people from the beginning of time to the end of time. This is part of a historical, you know, historical moment. African Americans took that form and started to write, again, these histories of the Negro race, which included... Um, often included starting with the Bible and moving on to the present and sometimes moving on into the future. So, you know, here is the end game. Here is God's plan for the future. It was a way of, again, of helping to explain all of this to African Americans in the South who needed to be, as they, as the Northerners thought, needed to be educated. It also became a way for Southern Blacks, I think, to embrace this history and become educated so that this, these books were used um, to teach people to read and, you know, to get them to understand the most basic things about history. And it was also at a time, even though, you know, for, for a few, for a few years after the, after the civil war, there was a moment in reconstruction where uh, African-Americans thought, Hmm, maybe this really is the promised land. Hmm. You know, we've now entered it. We're out of, you know, out of the wilderness. Um, Pretty soon, it started to look worse and worse. So after 1877, things rapidly go downhill. And of course, then you need to explain that. Mm -hmm. How can that, uh, we expected this glorious future. Why isn't it here yet? Well, you know, then these stories begin again to weave in 
tales of, well, it's not quite here yet. Here's what else we need to do. Um, so they focus on education and they focus on building institutions that can help to bring this about. Yeah, these histories were aspirational and sort of a drive for respectability. They were talking to African-American audiences, hoping to mold a particular type of African-American character. Exactly. Um, but also, I mean, they were sort of, this is where the double consciousness, I suppose, comes mm -hmm. in, right? The, um, that on the one hand, they're speaking to African-Americans to say, this is what it means to be a civilized people. Here's how we get there, right? So here's our glorious past that we have to draw on. But here's what we need to do. And isn't it wonderful we have the building of these institutions and there are all these, you know, really honestly boring institutional <laughs> histories that, ha that serve that purpose, right? To say, hey, we've got civilization just like the whites do. And it's just as good, if not better. So it's a way of sort of bringing what many people saw as the Southern ex-slaves who were not well educated into modernity, into this modern culture. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, they're speaking to whites to say, hey, we've got a history too. We've yeah. got a history just like you. We can write chronicles and uh, stories just as long and big and sprawling as yours. And what's fascinating about that to me is that uh, most of these were written by ministers, by people connected to churches and things, and, and were kind of outgrowths of that earlier denominational history, trying to do that for a, for a bigger purpose, for a bigger audience. And just at the same time that these stories start to appear, history as a professional and academic discipline starts to arise here. And white professional historians, it almost seems like they're, they're reacting to that, like, oh, well, we'll show you type of a thing. There's, there's a new assault on black identity as professional historians start to create history. Yeah, no, I, it's funny. I never thought of it quite that way to see the wise of right, white history as a, as a reaction against this, but it is certainly a way of reasserting power. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it ties in, there are a lot of factors. So this is tying in with the professionalization of, of disciplines in universities, not just history, but sociology, uh, you know, anthropology, other, other sorts of disciplines, but it does coincide with this. And Although, you know, preachers, because they, they are the ones most often educated, that was sort of the one educated profession initially that blacks could hold, they're the ones that begin to write these. But pretty soon, you know, it, it stretches out into other things. And by that's why someone like Du Bois is so important that, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of the first PhDs um, in, you know, in the 20th century, a black PhD. So you start to get a few people outside of these church networks that also, as they can get access to, if they can get access to universities, uh, start to gain some of the same kind of um, knowledge base and training. But then they're kept out of, you know, the white the white organization. So they start to form their own organizations, you know, black history organizations instead. These professionalizing white historians start telling stories, kind of drawing on new scientific ideas, right? Like there's these ideas of different races and phenotypes and, and you know, whether blacks came from the same human origins and whether they could become as civilized or elevated as whites. And, and these are the histories that the new professional historians are starting to put together. Yeah, um, I would say not all historians, but certainly Southern historians and, um, well, they're not just Southern historians, actually, a lot of white historians. <laughs> you don't want to be a lumper. Of, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not a lumper, and it's, yeah, I don't want to just blame it on the South, because I think there are a lot of, <laughs> lot of Northern, Northern racists at this point, too. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, you know, here's the dilemma for whites after the Civil War. You know, you've had this moment of reconstruction where African Americans start to go into politics. Well, you shut that down, right? You shut down the access to voting, but you still have these African Americans who are literate and writing and, yeah. and, uh, and you have to figure out sort of, and again, it's not quite this calculated. This is sort of the, the short version, the, the cliff notes, but you have to figure out and make sense of why our culture, A, our culture is superior and why, you know, how you exclude them from American society or a sort of civilized society on other terms because they can't be excluded anymore legally in a racial, sort of racialized uh, in the slave system. So how else do you do it? Well, you have stories about 
these uncivilized, scary blacks who are, you know, if you let them loose, right, if you don't somehow contain or control them, they're, you know, they're not capable. They're not capable, in other words, of being fully civilized members of society. That's what the racialized histories, I think, do in part. Yeah. It's the point when a lot of the stereotypes that still exist in some circles were really Absolutely. solidified about violence, about laziness, a yep. lot of stereotypes get Absolutely. and came up through professional historians as they created a new discipline. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And they, they, it, this is not sort of just the purview of uneducated people. This is yeah. also sort of professionalized whites who are spreading these and writing these stories. And as you mentioned, literacy too. I mean, black literacy just boomed. They, I think the numbers that you cite, they, they went from 80% illiterate in 1870 to, down to 30% illiterate in 1910. That is, that is a huge change. It's a huge change, yeah, and it was due in large part to the, the efforts of African American institutions to get people, not only, you know, to, to give people literacy, but it gave them a control over their lives, and it gave them, you know, it, it was also sort of bringing them into what African Americans saw as sort of, this was the antidote to racism. You just prove to whites that these people can, you know, are equals, and surely they'll see this and <laughs> surely they'll uh, sort of allow us entry into all the institutions in this society. So these authors would write histories, they would write primers, they would write books for, for educational settings and, and yeah. all sorts of writings. And they're largely lost to time now. They're forgotten, as you note, even by many historians. Your book was sort of an intervention to raise these from the dust. What happened to these works? Why did they fall off the map so hard? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, again, some of it's about preservation. There wasn't, I mean, ironically, <laughs> even though there's history embedded in, in so many of these stories and, and they talk about the importance of history, there, was not, there were not the resources to preserve them uh, at, at this point in ways. You know, now we know that when you don't preserve manuscript or books from about 1880 to 1920 which were made with uh, i think it's highly acidic paper mm. they'll crumble in your hands if you so some of this is just not purposeful neglect but we don't you know we we have too much to do we don't have to we don't, can't spend our time we can't afford to hire mm. an archivist to do all this so some of this is just the state of archives, which until really the last 20 years was, was pretty terrible. I remember sending in a, I had a former graduate student from the early 90s who wanted to do work on the AMEZ church in the 20th century. And I sent him down to Salisbury College in North Carolina. I was living in Chapel Hill at the time. Sent him down to Salisbury College, which was an AMEZ school. And it was where their archive, the archives for the church were. And the archives were basically, you know, a one person trying her best, you know, to keep track of all this stuff and get it cataloged, but just boxes of stuff, you know, that, that had been given. So there just wasn't the, the kind of resource available to do the preservation that needed to be done. On the other hand, there was an interest by whites. You know, they didn't think that this was worth, worth anything. They thought it was just silly, silly stuff. Um, they, they didn't take it seriously. So, and there weren't enough blacks, you know, who were getting PhDs or who were doing advanced research um, or had the resources to go into these archives until very recently. That's Lori Maffley Kipp, and we're talking about setting down the sacred past African-American race histories. The Negro race histories that, that we just talked about, they, they were written by men, right? And these, these men were contending with a white racist culture in order to tell their stories. And in the last chapter of your book, you show how, in a similar way, black women were bumping up against restrictions within their own communities among African Americans. Right, right. So, you know, as, as people will often say today, African American women face sort of a double oppression, right? Yeah. Um, an oppression based on their race but also one based on gender or just there were um, the culture of the black church in the late 19th century was not an egalitarian culture. Um, women couldn't be ordained and couldn't become preachers. Uh, and so it limited their options in particular ways. And what interested me was that there were women who found ways to talk about history outside of those channels. And it's still, you know, it's, it's, it was the case then, it's the case now that, 
women, particularly mothers or other uh, overseers of sort of young children, are the ones who first give us our history. You know, they first pass along stories of, of the past to us. And women, um, even though they couldn't preach and therefore couldn't publish sermons, they found other ways to talk about history through poetry, through um, columns in black newspapers, through books, sometimes more and more through books as, as time went on. But they were fighting you know, a double battle. They had these men who were, again, saying there are only certain kinds of speech that are allowed for women. And they pushed back. It was so interesting to see how these women found increasing space in the press. Yes. Because men were ruling the pulpit, so they found these alternate avenues to do this. But even then, there was some pushback or some control that still uh, affected what they could do. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things I, I uh, realized after a while is that, so there are black newspapers that, that proliferate after, especially after the Civil War. And the, the AME Christian Recorder is probably the most widely circulated uh, black newspaper in the South at the time. And it's only in the, the very end of the 19th century that editors, all, all male, editors um, of these papers started to put in a woman's column, right? <laughs> and prior to that, there had been women writing for them, but they had, their writings had been scattered around. And so on the one hand, you could think, oh, that's great. They have a women's column just for, just for women to talk yeah. about the things they want to talk about. It shows the really popularity, good. yeah. No, right, yeah. right. On the other hand, all of a sudden it dawned on me one day, well, wait a minute, you know, by relegating women to the women's column, it means that they aren't as free to write about all of these other things that are going on about politics, about, you know, culture of the day. So they're sort of pushed into this thing called the women's column, which tends to deal much more exclusively with children, uh, with being a housewife, with sort of this aspirational ideal to domesticity, um, which is not a bad thing, but it, the point is it channels, it also channels what they can do. And then they, they, you have the editor often at the beginning or the end of the column weighing in in some way that sort of um, doesn't belittle what the women are doing, but play, but really constrains it, constrains it to say, isn't it great? The women are training the children and they're fixing up the household so that men can do all the other stuff. So it's, um, it's a double-edged sword, right? It's sort of acknowledgement of women, but a placing of women on a, on a particular kind of pedestal. Yeah, and it probably allowed less men to reckon with it as well. Oh, this is the women's column. I right. can go over that. Skip right, they skip right over that piece. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed how you showed how African-American men and African-American women often told the history of slavery itself in, in radically different ways, emphasized different things about slavery, and that women were more attuned to the family elements of slavery. Yeah, that's it's still something that I puzzle about. And, um, you know, I would... I would love someone to write more about this at some point, but I, I did discover that the race histories I read by the male race histories, for the most part, don't talk about slavery. It's sort of silence. In a lot, or if they do, it's in very general terms because they want to skip right along to what's, what's waiting after that. And I don't know, the women just wrestle with it in a different way. And I, I, you know, one kind of theorizing about that is just that men, for, for men, there's sort of a, uh, an emasculation that slavery represents, that to be, you know, we want to present ourselves as real men. And slavery took that away from us, took away our agency and our ability to, uh, so, and I don't mean in a, in a, just in a sexual way, I mean in a, you know, in sort of cultural masculinity, what it represents. And uh, this isn't, you know, we don't, we don't want to dwell on that. We want to move on to, to power and to times when we've had more power and more control in our lives. For women, you know, there's a different sense of power in the first place or what is what women uh, can aspire to and how they're thinking about their lives. And so much of that revolves around keeping communities together. That in a sense, the idea of keeping a community together under slavery is a heroic act for women. Yeah. And some women even recoiled from that. I'm thinking about yeah. the example of Angelina Weld Grimke and her play that she wrote, Rachel. I mean, it opens yeah. up with this scene of a woman 
talking about how she says, I love the little black and brown babies best of all, more than the other babies I feel that I must protect them. So she has this desire to be a mother and to bring babies into the world and to love and honor these. And you say, by, by the end, that's completely reversed for her. She's become embittered and, and even cynical because of seeing how the world would be for those babies. And the, the quote you include from the end is where she says, uh, she's she's sort of having these visions of of her future children sort of coming to her and and she says my children come and beg me weeping not to bring them here to suffer and i've promised them again now i have damned my soul to all eternity if i do you call it an anti annunciation yeah yeah it's a horror story isn't it um the end of you know the end of history i guess is if you sort of uh are shutting at the possibility of bringing more children into the world it's to say there is no future for us here. That was one of the most moving, um, mm. moving passages of the book for me, in part because of what's happening today and what, what's happening in the United States. And yeah. I wanted to conclude the interview by asking you about what lessons you think your study can still offer to Americans today at a time of ongoing divisions and racial tensions in the United States. Yeah, I think um, uh, it, it, there there are so many ways in which this story, at least where my story ends up in the early 20th century, is still continuing. Um, I And I, I begin, I opened the book, I think it was not long after the issue uh, came up with Jeremiah Wright, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who had been Obama's minister in Chicago. And he gets in trouble for this clip, you know, this clip that comes out saying, um, God damn America, right? Mm -hmm. That's taken it's out of context. Sermon, yeah. yeah, very fiery. Yeah. Put them in the lowest paying jobs. Put them outside the equal protection of the law. Kept them out of their racist bastions of higher education and locked them into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three strike law, and then wants us to sing God bless America. No, no, no. Not God bless America. God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent and people. God damn America for treating a citizen as less than human. God damn America as long as she tries to act like she is God and she is supreme. The United States government has failed the vast majority of her citizens of African descent. It's taken completely out of context and taken to mean that this is, a, again, the, the, the image of the scary black mm -hmm. who somehow is threatening whites uh, with this fiery rhetoric. This is still with us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I have heard Jeremiah Wright in m many times since then give lectures and speeches which are incredibly nuanced and place that in a context which makes complete sense of it and makes sense of this as a biblical injunction to do better, right? This isn't, this isn't you know, God's going to smite you all for your sins. It's a way of saying, look, you know, this, we can do better than this. And it's a way of sort of encouraging people and pulling them up. So it's sort of, it, it's intended for the opposite purposes. But there's so, there's so many of those tropes from the early 20th century that are still in our culture. And frankly, I think, a fear uh, on the part of there are many whites who don't have access or don't don't seek access to African American communities and life, so don't know about this this history or the the kind of struggling with and thought that's gone into trying to make miss sense of the experience of African Americans in our society. But I think the more whites can learn about that, the more the more they'll see the commonalities and the more they'll see that this isn't something to fear at all. It isn't anything scary. It's often, you know, good people just trying to make sense of the world. Yeah. I, I remember that. I remember when that sermon hit the news and, you know, the initial feeling in the context they presented it in is him saying, when goddamn America, him saying, oh, here's this person who hates America and he's Obama's right. pastor, so Obama hates America or right. whatnot. And instead of realizing within the context, this is this is a preacher who's saying, here, here are what are supposed to be American values that are not being lived up to. Exactly. And for that reason, there, there could be divine judgment as a result of that. It's, it's thoroughly biblical. 
And African American Christians have been saying this all along, saying that going back to Frederick Douglass, yeah, again, saying, Fourth of July is not for me. Exactly. This is not this is, America as an ideal is a wonderful thing. I love that America. We have to live up to that ideal. We're not there yet. How do you feel like your personal life has changed as a, as a result of your study of these histories? You spend a lot of time on this and it can't help but spill over into your own life, I assume. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. I suppose you know, I'll tell one sort of one anecdote that maybe says a lot about it. Um, I moved to St. Louis four years ago and I, a year after I moved here, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm-hmm. And so there was, you know, a, a lot of unrest, not nearly as much rioting as was portrayed on the national news, but, you know, some, some real, real struggles and you know, violence. Um, so it was a hard time. And I was, at the time, I uh, attended a church here that is actually in the same denomination that Jeremiah Wright is from, the, the United Church of Christ, which is my denomination. It's a, it's a predominantly, overwhelmingly white denomination, but there are some churches within the denomination that are all black churches, including an all black church uh, in Florissant, which is right next door to Ferguson in Missouri. And there is a woman preacher there uh, named uh, Tracy Blackman, who has become sort of nationally known now for her, for her work around diversity and racism. And I was attending that church and it struck me um, in hearing the ways that that church struggled to deal with, on the one hand, their sense of Christian witness and service and what the horrible things that were going on in culture, that the, the, church, the church meant two things. The, well, many things, but the church meant at least two things uh, in this regard. One is that it gave people stories. It gave people stories not only to explain the events that were going on around them, but to help them get through the week, to help them get through the months, to help them move on, even in a really, really difficult time. And uh, the reason that struck me so much is because for a long time, scholars have talked about black churches as being either otherworldly, meaning they don't worry so much about what's going on in this world. They're just, they just care about, so the afterlife. So they're what compensatory in a way. They're just Mm -hmm. trying to struggling to get through or yeah. Yeah. Or they're activists and they're going out, you know, into the community and like Martin Luther King Jr. sort of pushing for, for activism of various sorts. But what I see in this church in Florissant is that these, those two things, it's a false dichotomy. Those two things are blended together, that in some ways it's precisely that history and that sense of understanding the Bible uh, through one's own historical lens that gives people the strength to go on in the face of real, some really bad bad times. And that church is, it's an amazing place. But I think there are a lot of black churches like that, where there's a struggle, but also a sense that, you know, we, we have to endure. And this is a way to get through, but it's also a way to explain and to help us change things around us. So I don't know if that, that's, un, that's kind of abstract, I guess, but it just it hit me, I guess, in a really visceral way, that that these stories have a real purpose. You know, some people had sort of still been saying, well, it's nice that the African-Americans told these stories, gave us this history, but, you know, some of it was just kind of made up and what, weren't they just fooling themselves? Well, no, they were, they, this, was a, this was part of a process of remembering that gives people strength to go on. And that's something that everyone should be able to relate to, regardless yeah. of their background. Yeah, well, certainly in the Mormon case is, you know, not far afield, right? The history does a lot of things for us. That's Lori Maffley Kipp. She's the Archer Alexander Distinguished Professor at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. She taught religious studies and American studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill before that, and uh, is a prior president of the Mormon History Association. She's written and edited many books about things like African-American religions, Mormonism, Protestantism. And today we talked about her book, Setting Down the Sacred Past, African-American Race Histories. Lori, thank you for taking the time to talk about the book today with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Blair. Thank you.